Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and speak to you. Um, I've got a relatively short period, so I hope you don't mind if we blast through this fairly quickly. Uh, background to this, uh, why is a, a banker at a spatial data science conference? Well, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit about the data science that we use at, at the bank, and I think you'll see what's going on there. The technology that we use in contrib con contributing to the digital twin that I'm going to talk about next, I thought it was important to fill in some of the technology pieces that we have in play. So let me walk through those real quick. Uh, the first one, obviously, is machine learning. I don't, don't believe that needs any kind of definition. It is very pervasive in the bank, and there are whole uh, teams that are devoted to, to the data science that is, is wrapped around uh, machine learning. Uh, the technology group inside the bank is about 11,000 people and a very large portion of those people are devoted to machine learning. So it's a fairly substantial part of the bank. The second one is ontology. I don't think that needs a definition either, but it's unusual for an organization to put as much focus on ontology as we do. Uh, it's a very, very important piece of the structure of the data that we work with. It provides a robust, robust backbone for the technology that we assemble and it's a definitive uh, and executable check. Uh, so for example, uh, there's a, in play is a kinship ontology, and that kinship ontology basically says you can't marry your sister. Um, it, it, so those rules in play actually govern the way that we handle the data, and they govern the way that that data is related to other data. Oops, sorry. Uh, the next one is differential privacy. That probably deserves a little bit more definition. Uh, I've often said differential privacy is as close as software gets to magic as, as uh, is possible. But pr the principle of it is that private data can be appropriately anonymized but still be accessible to analytics. So this, this is actually very imp a very important capability. Banks in Canada in particular are subject to enormous regulatory pressure, enormous pressure. So we, we Practically everything that the bank does is, is audited in detail, and it has to be documented and, and, and clearly explained. So that means that our uh, perception and use of the, the, the data that flows through the bank is, has to be very carefully controlled. And this is where differential privacy comes in. Once we use differential privacy on a data set, you cannot get back to the individuals that contributed to that data. It's just impossible to go backwards from it. Um, just for context, uh, the Royal Bank of Canada processes 800 million transactions a day. So all of that data has to be subject to privacy constraints. So it's not a, it's not a small problem. Next one, location intelligence, where we're at a spatial data science uh, uh, meeting. I hardly, hardly think I need to define that one. But the next one is important because Javier was, Javier was actually talking about this before uh, in, in, in different words. So I characterize this data join problem as I want to study migratory habits of butterflies, for example. I'm just making this up. And so I have a data set that's been published which shows where accumulations of butterflies happen. And I also have a data set that gives me the water bodies. But the butterfly migration is related to places, not locations, and is in a completely different projection from the data set with the water. And the precision, the spatial precision of the two is completely different. So I have that, that's that fundamental data join problem where we crash into it everywhere. And Javier spoke eloquently about that this morning. That's a problem that even the bank has. That how do you make those data sets come together? So there is an initiative throughout Canada to actually assemble massive data sets that have that capability built in of being able to join immediately. The next one is synthetic data. I mentioned earlier about the privacy constraints that we operate under, and those privacy constraints uh, are dramatically alleviated by the use of synthetic data. And synthetic data essentially is a recreation of the data set that would lead to the outcomes 
that you would get from the original data set. It's used in various places, and I'm predicting that this will be a very major portion of our, of our future looking uh, setups where any, any place where private data might be involved, where, where we need to control that, that data, that synthetic data will emerge. So we've built synthetic data simulators that actually produce synthetic data that represent what's going on inside our data sets. Uh, neural symbolic AI. So everybody knows about machine learning, and you probably know about this, but just in case, neural symbolic AI actually is a hybrid of machine learning as we know it, neural nets, and the rigors, particularly in this case, coming from ontology. So it basically controls, it's an anchor for the exploration that the neural net actually does. The next one, uh, extract, uh, I'll go straight to graph databases because that's a foundational element of our uh, piece of uh, technology called the digital twin. In fact, what I'll do is I'll go to the next one. These are the foundation elements that make up the digital twin. Uh, federated access, basically, this is a mechanism within the bank whereas where massive uh, storage uh, facilities are, are linked together. So we don't copy the data around unless we absolutely have to. We federate that data instead. Artificial intelligence and digital twin. Let me sw swap straight to the digital twin. So it's my belief that it's actually the bank's belief as well that this digital twin technology is going to be fundamental and foundational to our spatial uh, exercises in the future. It's, uh, it was started in, it really came to prominence in 2010 when NASA started using digital twins of satellites and those digital twins of satellites, somebody's telling me I have nine minutes left. Those, those uh, you see, it's a bad idea to take a $3 billion satellite and destructive, uh, test it destructively. So they, what, what they did was create a complete virtual model of the capabilities of the satellite, the physical capabilities and the execution capabilities. So when the, um, earthquakes happened in, in New Zealand. Not long after that, uh, I run a research organization in Australia, and that research organization was uh, uh, approached, is there something that we can do to work out how to rebuild uh, the uh, earthquake-affected areas in, in New Zealand, uh, Christchurch, actually? And so I suggested, well, let's build a digital twin of the desired state of the town city of Christchurch, which is what we actually did. And if you, you can look that up on the internet, there's, there's uh, some stories there. Not long after that, uh, Singapore built a digital twin based on the same idea. So now the notion of a digital twin has expanded from the mechanical space into the location space. Uh, so we're in the process of building up a digital twin which has several layers to it. The idea uh, behind it is, first of all, you have the physical layer. Okay, it's got all the streets, it's got all the, the lamp posts, it's got the transit systems, it's got the movement of people, uh, it's got all the physical aspects. But what the bank can bring to that is, is all the virtual pieces as well. So a person goes here and executes a transaction at this location. A person goes here and does this uh, financial act activity. Now see, that's a little intrusive, but the notion behind it is that we have deductions from that that we can act on immediately. So I'll give you a great example. Um, suppose RBC changed the five-year fixed mortgage rate. What would the effect of that be on climate change? And right now, that's a question we cannot answer, but I contend that we should be able to answer that. And in fact, we should be able to answer that question for every decision that the bank makes, and not just for the bank. We should be able to answer that question for every decision that the, that the, the government makes. And private individuals should be able to make that decision as well. So it's a big story and a big game. Um, then the third layer that we bring into play is the social layer. So we haven't even touched that yet, but the notion there is that we can understand social interactions of people and places in the digital twin as well. So it's a, it's a grand story. The vision here is that 
Underneath this will be, we'll, we will assemble a knowledge graph. And that, that knowledge graph will have executable elements in it. Those executable elements are subject to the rigors of ontological realism. The ontology completeness uh, gives us an idea of where places, where data is missing. So we should be able to ask the digital twin, this is as it should be, because we're not there yet, we should be able to ask the digital twin, I want you to answer this question, now tell me what data you don't have that would enable you to answer that question. So that's a very powerful concept. We've also worked very hard on building ontologies, um, actually building that structure of the ontology and the, and the fabric of the ontology uh, automatically. So we're actually reading documents using machine learning to generate the ontology that that document represents. So that's a very important aspect of this as well. The presence of computational agents in the digital twin is very important. Uh, a digital twin in, in and of itself is a representation, but once you have active agents in there, it becomes predictive. So now we can look ahead and say, hey, um, we happen to know that your farm, as a farmer, we happen to know that your farm has some aspects of drought appearing in it. And we are recommending that you irrigate within the next three weeks. That's something that a bank can do with, with ease once they have the digital twin. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was um, we've, we've referred to them as ripples because I don't know that there's anybody who's actually coined a name for them. But the idea is that you perturb an element of the digital twin. So you say, okay, let's change the interest rate. That causes a ripple of the executable elements of the digital twin to produce a result set. And you can do that many times. It's called in the world avatar, which is one of the digital twins out there, uh, that this, is a refer this is referred to as the uh, active layer or the executable layer. And that, that, capable, that executable capability is, is um, foundational to the digital twin because it then it makes it real. And they, they refer to it as, a, as a parallel universes. So they actually create a parallel and discard it. These are some example queries of, of, uh, of work that we actually have. These are, these are actually real live questions. Uh, so the first one I actually mentioned already, the five-year fixed mortgage rate. The second one is, is absolutely fascinating, not from just from the bank standpoint, but from the, from the economics of the country standpoint. So a supply chain is disrupted. So there's an avalanche in the Rockies, and the 18-wheelers the, 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 um, cannot get through. What's, <clears throat> what's the alternate supply chain that we recommend how does that supply chain kick into place? Obviously, if you have a graph database with, uh, as a basis for the digital twin, you can understand how those progressions affect, are affected. Um, <clears throat> another valuable place that this uh, resonates and I think is, is fundamentally important is in the, in the space of uh, climate change. And, and climate change is all over the place. Uh, um, all kinds of organizations are, are stressed about how do I respond to the climate change challenge? How can I put mitigation processes in place in my organization? And the digital, we believe the digital twin is the right answer to this. But it's only the right answer if other organizations are contributing to it. So I wind back to where I was talking about differential privacy. If we can guarantee that organizations outside the bank are able to put data into the digital twin structured appropriately and built on top of the ontology realism, then we have a very powerful tool there for understanding and, and, and mitigating climate change um, across the board. So, and one of the background things to this is that banks operate on trust. The reason that you go to a bank and put your money there is that you trust the bank. So that's, fundamental under, that's a fundamental underpinning to the bank. That means that we think banks are the right place to go 
to start this initiative and build up uh, the, the digital twin capabilities because other organizations already trust the bank with their funds. So it's reasonable for them to trust the bank with, with, uh, with the data that is uh, safely sequestered behind the, um, the uh, differential privacy. Nice pictorial representation of the three layers, and I'm getting very close to the end of my time here, so I will skip that. And mention just one more thing. Um, the ultimate protection of the digital twin and, and the ultimate uh, ex capability of exposing this to the outside world is if the twin itself is synthetic. So we have a hypothetical idea, <laughs> unfortunately not real yet, that we can build a synthetic copy of the actual digital twin. And we can perturb it as much as we like, but be, once it's synthetic, once it's now guaranteed safely separated from, from the real world, then that's readily publishable and readily usable by uh, external sources. And that's me, there's my contact details there, please Please uh, don't hesitate to reach out if there's something that, um, that I can help you with or that uh, you'd like to get involved with. Um, on the left-hand side, that's from the world avatar. That's the active agent slayer. And that's it. That's me done. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>